Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Audrey Vernick. I'm the Director of Patient and Family Advocacy for the Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Alliance. We are the only nonprofit organization whose sole focus is serving the community of children anywhere on the epilepsy surgery journey from the point of drug resistance through surgery, including the transition to adulthood and beyond. We empower our families with research, support services, and impactful programs before, during, and after surgery. We were formerly known as the Brain Recovery Project, and we're now in our 12th year of serving this community. Our Power Hour sessions are brought to you by our corporate sponsor, UCB, and we're incredibly grateful for their support. And while we switch the slides over, I'm going to introduce our phenomenal speaker today. I hope you'll all be as thrilled to hear from her as I am. Her name is Amy McGuire, and she's a speech and language pathologist, um, PhD, um, at um, MG, Mass General Hospital and MGH Institute. She has been working with Dr. Joanna Christodoulou um, at the MGH uh, Beam Lab, um, who's also a professor at Harvard. They have been researching uh, post uh, individuals after hemispherectomy at our conferences over the past uh, several years and have published a couple of different papers. And today she's gonna talk to us about working memory and cognitive load and how we can help um, ourselves and our school teams understand this um, better after epilepsy surgery. Thank you so much for joining us, Amy. Hello, hello. I just wanna verify that you're seeing my presentation screen and not my slide screen, yes? Yes, I see your slide. Great, yes. okay. So hi everybody, it's really lovely. Uh, to be here talking with you. Um, I am going to be discussing a little bit about uh, working memory and cognitive load today. And thank you to Audrey for that lovely introduction. I have just some disclosures. Um, I receive a full-time salary at Mass General Hospital and a part-time salary from the MGH Institute of Health Professions. Um, and I have some non-compensated affiliations doing research through the MGH IHP. And I'm a member of um, ASHA and the Society for Neuroanthropology. Um, and as Audrey mentioned, I work with Dr. Krista Dulu at the BEAM lab, the Brain Education and Mind lab at the MGH Institute. Um, we're here in Boston and um, Dr. Krista Dulu's specialty and my growing specialty um, is thinking about um, reading development, um, reading intervention, um, the needs of uh, children and adults um, who may have undergone Neurosurgery is my particular angle um, and looking at how that affects reading, uh, math, and cognitive outcomes at large. Okay. Um, so in, in my experience clinically and through my, my research experience with Dr. Christodoulou, right, it's really clear to me that neurosurgery is not a common experience, um, particularly when it's a child who is undergoing neurosurgery, it's a really rare uh, thing to kind of come across uh, for both um, students, children, and families. And um, while we have a lot of information studying uh, the clinical outcomes, like the healthcare-related outcomes, what happens from a medical perspective um, to children who have had epilepsy and then undergo surgery, um, there isn't a whole lot of research that specifically focuses on academic outcomes, right? How do children who have had epilepsy surgery do in school after that, both in the immediate aftermath of surgery, um, just, you know, getting back into the swing of daily life, but then also long-term. And so that's one of the things that we're really interested in learning a lot more about, Dr. Christodoulou and I. Um, so that means that predicting school performance is actually pretty difficult after surgery. Um, not to mention the fact that every child who has epilepsy uh, might be having a slightly different manifestation of that condition um, and the type of surgery that the child might undergo um, can vary a lot. So there's a little bit more um, variance, for lack of a better word, um, among children who um, have epilepsy surgery. Um, not to mention that school systems everywhere in this country tend to vary a whole lot as well. And so it's very tough to figure out exactly what the right formula is for each individual student that might have had surgery um, and to guarantee that, that we're gonna get the best outcome, right? So it's a complicated space. And there is a disconnect also just between the healthcare system, medical, providers and um, school educators, right? 
I, I think it's it's easy for health providers, and I, I primarily work in, in a hospital medical setting, right, to say, oh, well, I think the schools will probably take care of that, right? And then the schools will sometimes say, well, well, that child seems to have a lot of really particular medical needs. I think that's more of the medical issue, um, and they'll take care of it. Um, and it's really easy to get stuck in the middle, and then who's left holding the, holding the, holding the bag, so to speak, um, parents and families, and, and it's confusing to know what to do, right? And I definitely hear a lot that, you know, people are saying, the school will know what to do to help me or my child, right? They know how to advocate um, and work with children who have specific learning needs, but often that's not quite the case um, for children after neurosurgery. So I know it's frustrating. Um, at the end of the day, right, what we're most interested in, and I say we, I'm not a parent of a child who has had um, epilepsy surgery, but as a rehab provider, and that's what, when I say we, but I, I have a feeling we're probably aligned in what we're looking for, right? And we're really just trying to see the whole picture to support what is gonna be um, leading to the best opportunities for learning and the most success, right? And it's kind of hard when we're sitting in these meetings um, with school administrators, teachers, everybody seems to have, you know, um, the right uh, outlook or, or um, we're, we're looking for the similar things, but we might not see it from exactly the same angle. And what happens is, we, you know, we've got this picture here where there are lots of people looking in a very narrow way at this elephant and calling it a whole bunch of different things. Um, sometimes we really have to step back and uh, take a big view and try to get on the page a little, on the same page a little bit more. Uh, Okay, so when we're trying to understand working memory and this idea of cognitive load, um, let's imagine for a second in our own lives, right? Um, let's imagine that uh, we have a little bit of work to do. Maybe we're, you're on your computers now, maybe you're on your phone. Um, maybe you need to be on that device in order to accomplish a few tasks and you're like, oh, I don't really wanna do them, but you know what, I'm motivated now and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bang them out and then take me 30 minutes and then I'm gonna go do other things that I'm looking much more forward to. Okay, so this is us typing away. But then we see this. I'm sure we've all experienced um, seeing kind of the, the rotating beach ball of frustration and the, then the hourglass that comes up. And you know that everything you intended to accomplish on that computer and you were gonna get it done so quickly, it's probably not gonna be all that efficient anymore, right? And so what, what does this mean? Why are we thinking about this experience? Um, what do we feel when this comes up, right? What's happening? I, I thought I was gonna have access to, to the chat, so I was gonna ask you to throw in some reactions here, um, but apologies, I don't think I, I do, right? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna predict. Essentially, we're not only frustrated, we might be, we might, this might be the straw that broke our back that evening, right? It might be like, ah, oh, I feel like I'm gonna have a meltdown. Right. But basically, internally, right, our computer can't do anything else. It's stuck. Right. And there isn't enough space uh, in, in the computer's um, available memory and available resources to complete the process. And so that's a little bit of a good analogy for what might happen at a brain level for kids post surgery, um, post seizure, even um, when working memory or cognitive load is really limited, right? The brain budget essentially at that moment is really, really low. And what does it look like when your student or child kind of has their own version of the spinning beach ball or that little hourglass that comes up? What's happening? I'm sure you have a lot of incidents where you can kind of think about what that felt like, what it looks like. You can imagine your child experiencing maybe that moment in a classroom and what happens afterwards, right? It means that new learning tends to be really difficult. It might mean that it's very hard to pay attention. And you know your child might be aware that that's happening and just feel really stuck. And then regulating emotions might become really difficult, right? Controlling other behaviors are tough. Frustration thresholds tend to be lower. So we get easily thrown into like just oh, being really exasperated. And then that frustration tolerance is probably even reduced as well. And then we're just kind of stuck and we need to take a big break, or we need something that's gonna help us reframe the situation so that we can re-engage, okay? So this, this is a little bit of an analogy for understanding what working memory 
um, is when working memory has changed or is limited um, by a seizure or in a post-surgical context, which for some children, um, it's, it definitely is. Um, one way we can think of working memory is kind of like, like a cognitive cost, like a brain cost, right? Um, another way we could think about working memory is really just like the heavy mental load that we might need to lift, right? And a cognitive cost or a cognitive load that can be associated with any activity or any learning opportunity. So we can think about this as it applies to doing something at home, um, you know, going out to buy a, one or two things at the grocery store or a whole load of things, right? There's a cognitive cost associated with that, behaving, focusing, things like that. Um, or it could be in a classroom context, um, any particular skill that is gonna be demanded of, you know. Um, the more limited the working memory is for a person, the higher the cognitive load tends to feel or will easily become. And this is a really important concept when we're trying to think about how to advocate and change uh, circumstances to support learning in the best way possible, okay? So working memory tends to be like a little bit of a difficult term. Um, and you're not the only one if you feel like, well, what, I don't, I'm not even sure what working memory really is. It's actually um, not quite memory as we classically think about it. So I like to think of it more as this cognitive load idea. It's a mental weight that we're lifting, right? If we're lifting a weight that's too heavy, the cognitive load is too high, we can't learn or adapt right there on the left. But if it's too light and it's just way too easy and there's no effort involved at all, there's not really gonna be much learning and there's gonna be no adaptation as we go along. We're just kind of floating around free and easy. It can be totally enjoyable, but we're not necessarily building more skills that are linked to making further academic progress. Okay, so what we really want is to find the cognitive load for the individual person that's essentially just right or within a certain range that's gonna be most likely beneficial, right? And this is when learning and adaptation can take place, right? So there are different types of cognitive load or working memory. And one thing to think about, especially um, in, in a classroom context is that some types of cognitive load might work really well for a, a, ch a child and another type of cognitive load, right, might not. And so in general, when we think about cognitive load through this working memory idea, there can be visual and spatial cognitive load. And then there can also be kind of more, more language related cognitive load, like words, letters, sounds, things like that, okay? And these two types of load might actually behave differently depending on the individual student, right? Maybe maybe somebody struggles in both. Maybe somebody struggles more in one than the other. And it's important to try and get um, a little bit discerning about trying to figure out um, which one is doing what. Um, now, this is sometimes assessed by like a psychoeducational professional, but not always. And it can be very important to make sure that you're getting the right evaluation to understand what's really going on here. Um, so sometimes speech language pathologists may do this, uh, but more often than not for children in schools, pursuing a neuropsychological evaluation is gonna help bring some um, context and understanding to this, uh, this type of cognitive world question. Okay, so when we're trying to think about um, what is going to uh, best serve uh, a child's learning experience. One really important thing to think about alongside cognitive load is how much, how much input can the student's brain take and use in the moment, right, for, for adequate learning and engagement. That's a lot, that's a lot of words, right? So when we think about cognitive load, cognitive load tends to be um, relevant over kind of short periods of time. Um, when we are engaging in something um, that takes a while to execute and, you know, let's say we're trying to learn something in um, a classroom activity that's going to take 15 or 20 minutes. There is a cognitive load associated with that whole experience, but um, when we're thinking about cognitive load like uh, working memory, we might only even be thinking about it in, in a very short period of time, like less than 20 seconds. 
right? So how much can we expect the brain to hold on to in, in just a short window of time, just a moment, right? And we have to think about things like visual stimuli, tactile stimuli or touch, verbal stimuli, the language sounds coming in, and then other extraneous sounds that might also be um, in, some in some ways bombarding a student. Um, sometimes it feels that way. Um, versus what types of input are we really trying to deliver, right? To help that learning take place, right? Um, and when we think about what's coming in, right? What we're, we're, all of us are actually just like big receivers. At any given moment, we're being bombarded by little types of stimuli that we might notice or we might not, right? So um, even right now, wherever you're sitting, you're listening to my voice coming in, you might be hearing some background noises that I'm not aware of. You might be thinking about like the temperature of the room you're in. These are all types of input. Some of them are, are really obvious and conscious and some of them are not. But when it comes to learning for a student after epilepsy surgery, um, sometimes these really subtle subconscious inputs are playing a much bigger role. And if they're not well managed and we're not advocating to kind of reduce them as much as possible, it's gonna make learning even harder, right? So we also want to ask, are there inputs competing with what um, I, as a, as a therapist or a teacher, really needs the student to focus on and learn, right? Okay, so this is, this is actually um, a good moment to talk about these input modalities, right? And so in order to keep the cognitive load low, we want to try to limit um, all of the different inputs that might be taking taking place at that time, right? Um, so any extraneous motor demands to do, do something in class is gonna matter. Any extra visual demands we wanna limit um, and thinking about body sensations um, that might be distracting um, is also going to impact how learning happens in the classroom, right? So from a motor standpoint, right? Um, any timed activity that somebody is gonna be asked to, to do is probably going to increase the cognitive load in a way that might not actually benefit. Um, if we're only trying to learn a physical skill, maybe it makes sense to keep that time demand in place um, because we're working on just um, motor coordination and that's it. But if there's like a motor demand like writing um, involved in another bigger task where we're trying to um, organize our thoughts and write, um, and there's timing associated with that, we don't really want to build that in. We want to find other ways uh, to get that idea out and work with the idea so that motor isn't complicating it, right? And we might need to advocate around reducing that motor demand. Um, this is especially true if somebody's had any kind of um, handedness change. Um, so if your child has had a really substantial surgery that has affected the um, hand um, sensory motor coordination on one side of the body and it was the dominant hand, that's going to be um, something we want to um, buffer against when the student's trying to do a learning task. Um, so we want to remove extend or extend time limits in schoolwork and testing settings if there's a writing component. Maybe we can advocate for an alternative to motor writing um, using a scribe, um, some kind of speech to text opportunity. Um, if typing even with a non-dominant hand is a little easier than writing, um, that's often uh, something to explore. And then thinking about visual distractions, this can, re this can actually be a, a pretty substantial distractor. Um, so if, if there's, let's say, um, your child is situated near a hallway or a window where there tends to be a lot of movement, um, maybe even noise, right? It's more likely that those moving visual stimuli are going to pull your child's attention away from what it is they're supposed to be focusing on. And that's really hard, right? So we wanna think about what we can do for just physical situation in a classroom. And also when we're thinking about reading, we might need to actually just reformat the reading materials. Um, so putting aside reading mechanics and getting meaning out of reading, that aside, just the visual format um, of how the text appears. Um, so that might include changing the text size, requesting a larger print, 
um, thinking about high contrast materials, um, particularly if there is uh, a screen involved um, or if things can be reprinted on uh, high contrast paper, um, that can be helpful. Thinking about the text spacing and positioning, we might need to have recommendations written in to position most text on the left or the right side of the page. Um, and sometimes even just having a straight edge available or someone to help guide the eye down the page um, for the student can actually take some of that burden off. Um, in terms of body sensation, uh, that is not my specialty, but certainly advocating for occupational therapy um, for their recommendations to support any sensory needs in the classroom or strategies that might be allowable in the course of the school day is going to help uh, decrease some of the cognitive load and allow the student to bounce back and then re-engage. Um, so we think just about seizures, even outside of surgery, this is also an important um, consideration uh, when we're thinking about this cognitive load idea, because the capacity that anyone is able to uh, manage uh, after a seizure can really fluctuate in the aftermath. Um, even if somebody has just small, we would say subclinical um, seizure-like moments, um, that can also uh, change the, the cognitive load capacity, right? And so after a seizure, cognitive load might be substantially different in a way that isn't obvious um, for two to four weeks after, after the seizure event. Um, and it really depends on the circumstances. Um, but trying to advocate for more flexible deadlines and um, checking back in about um, the supports that might have been in place before that seizure happened, um, that is really important to try and build into the uh, classroom plan, um, talking with teachers and helping them understand why that's so important. Lots of times students need increased time to complete tests after a seizure, more time to complete in-class work or to take it home, um, and added therapy sessions and time for, for that type of support within the school week is important. Amy, I saw that um, Monica had her hand raised. Monica, do you want to ask your question now or do you want to hold it till the Q&A? That was an error. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. <laughs> okay. Um, I know I've been sort of switching between terms um, and working memory and cognitive load. Uh, kind of I'm, I'm using interchangeably, but just to make sure if people are looking for um, a little bit more of a definition of what working memory is, um, we can really think about it almost like a temporary mental storage area. And I mentioned how it can be applicable to a very short period of time, like 20 seconds, right? Um, that's how we sort of determine what that storage capacity is, right? It varies very much from person to person and it can actually change across the lifespan. And just as I mentioned, it can change just in the setting of surgery, um, a big change in medication can also alter some of the working memory um, or cognitive load capacities, um, a hospitalization. Um, and that's not necessarily something that shows up in the research literature. Um, it's something that I've certainly seen in clinical practice. Um, and it's really important to try and transmit that to um, teachers uh, because there's no, there's no way that they would know that really. Honestly, like I, I don't think I learned that. So it's it's a good thing to kind of share and keep reiterating that seizures and hospital admissions definitely do change some of this working memory or cognitive low capacity temporarily, and we can bring it back, but it does fluctuate, right? And again, the performance might be different depending on type of input. We we talked about that already. Um, another important idea is that unfamiliar information when there's no context tends to also essentially increase cognitive load and make things more difficult for learning. So for new information, way back in the day, we used to say, you know, you could hold about four things for 20 seconds. And that was sort of the average. If you're, if you're um, in early grade school, I would say that that's probably a little bit more like three things. Um, and that might even go on for a little longer um, if someone has had many uh, hospital admissions, um, maybe continues to have some seizure activity and it's not totally controlled um, or any any other sort of um, health related uh, up or down that they're that they're going through. Um, I think it's safe to say that we can kind of um, assume that maybe four could be could be generous. It might in increase as a child matures and continues to go through school, but there is a lot of range 
um, and familiar information if we're able to kind of um, recognize what the child knows and capitalize on that. Um, that can be retained maybe a little bit longer and that could allow us to put more things in there. So instead of three or four things, maybe when the information is super familiar, we can put a fifth one in there, maybe a sixth one, depending. Um, but those are some of the factors that um, contribute to working memory and that cognitive load capacity. Um, in our research, we've also found that working memory or cognitive load is very, very closely tied with word reading performance and math performance. But one important thing to consider is that it's really a specific type of math performance. So when we examined math, um, we were looking at very, very applied math concepts. So thinking highly conceptually, being able to kind of explain the relationship between objects and quantities, it was not the type of math performance where we're just practicing rote math facts, um, you know, two plus two is four, five times three is 15, right? It wasn't that kind of thing. Um, there were pictures, it was highly interactive, uh, or um, um, when I'm losing the word, not interactive, but um, multimodality, right? There was a visual, there was a verbal description, and there was actually no time component to that uh, math performance uh, task. So um, when we take that time constraint away, and there are uh, not just ver verbal, but visual components to help uh, maximize the conceptual understanding, children are able to do a lot better in, in math skills. All right. Um, and as I mentioned, working memory um, can recover or improve after surgery, especially when seizures are now controlled. So that's a really important factor for um, uh, just creating the conditions where working memory can be the best it can possibly be. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's automatically going to get bigger, um, but certainly if the brain continues to have seizures, it is a harder recovery process and it's harder to um, really understand working memory in a consistent way. Um, so recovery will depend again on where or how extensive the surgery was. Um, and a really important idea here is that while surgery is a good um, it's a good way to to for some for some individuals get control of that seizure activity um, and that helps cognitive load and working memory. Um, once we know, that that's the situation, we don't necessarily wanna waste a lot of time trying to focus on just building working memory alone. So working memory is important and cognitive load, this idea is really important, but it's actually not the goal to just look at that and say, if I improve this cognitive load capacity, that means everything else is gonna get solved. Unfortunately, <laughs> that isn't the case, right? And this, the studies that have um, looked at, at training working memory using computer programs or apps, things like that. Um, it really hasn't resulted in a lot of functional carryover. So even though there might be a little bit of a gain in the capacity, it doesn't necessarily translate into real world um, benefits because we're training it in such a narrow, narrow context. So one of the ways that we're really gonna look at um, addressing the importance of working memory is by thinking about um, maximizing knowledge already learned using that to build more knowledge and create lots of um, meaningful associations, um, build routines around the knowledge that children have, and then expand from there. That's one of the most um, supported ways to, to think about uh, how to build new knowledge considering the working memory capacity that somebody has, right? So as I mentioned, unfamiliar information is a much heavier cognitive load. It's a heavier mental lift. It's more effort. It also doesn't, we don't have anything to kind of hang ideas on. Um, and that means that it's gonna be harder to retrieve um, and harder to integrate and apply in any way, shape or form, right? So hopefully, right, in school, classes and grade levels are building on knowledge that you're getting year after year. If it's not, we need to make um, stronger efforts to create, you know, through lines uh, between the subjects, the themes um, that are being discussed, uh, and repeat that a lot. Um, in daily life, this is also applicable too, outside of the classroom, having routines for everyday things, right? Getting dressed, um, sequences of events for particular um, uh, 
days or, or settings can be really important, even if they're small, um, but really highlighting and verbalizing, kind of narrating what's happening, that can be really helpful. Um, and having visuals that highlight that routine as well. Connecting new information to things that we already know um, makes the learning just a whole lot more efficient, right? And we want to make sure we're doing this in a really explicit way. So the more, even if you're just at home, the more you can narrate these connections and bring really specific verbal attention to them uh, and even experience them together, um, the more you can do that, the better. Okay. Um, just have a, a few slides to kind of talk about some general um, supportive recommendations, um, which you may or may not find uh, applicable to IEPs, um, and then we'll do some questions. But um, in terms of reading and language support, um, always advocating for something that's going to be a phonics-based reading instruction um, that supports um, or is built out of right the science of reading. Um, in general, uh, a whole language approach, which is really teaching whole words um, and doesn't emphasize uh, sounds, letter knowledge, and the manipulation of sounds, um, tends to make reading a little bit more effortful. We're, we're not reducing that cognitive load. We're keeping it kind of high. So uh, to support reading and literacy skills, we really want to get down to the level of letter names, letter sounds, that knowledge uh, in a structured format like Orton Gillingham, um, Tellian Lively Letters is another good strategy um, for building that type of knowledge. And then um, therapy and academic activities that focus on the sequence of sounds and words, how to set, uh, segment syllables, so sound segmentation skills like that, dropping syllables, adding syllables. Um, we want to prioritize vocabulary building that's centered around subject matter. Right, and so the more we can understand what the topics are in subjects, you know, across the child's school day, whether that's science, history, math, all of these areas, um, the better. So we can kind of um, create multiple opportunities to use similar words across subject, um, allowing audiobooks where they are available and appropriate to the material being taught in the class. It's also great. Um, and as much as possible, offering students the choice for the reading materials they want to engage in is also going to be beneficial. Um, if we're always telling our, our children or students what they have to read, um, it's not necessarily capitalizing on the things that they know and like, and that actually plays a really important role uh, in furthering literacy development. Um, this idea of experiential co-reading is also very important, particularly if a student um, can easily experience fatigue, right? So if all of a sudden that cognitive load becomes high, maybe it's not even because of the task, maybe it's because there are distractions in the environment or something else is going on, maybe they're just not feeling well or emotions or, or distraction, right? Having periods where they can try some of the reading mechanics themselves, but then you have opportunities to take over that reading responsibility and intermingle your reading with their reading and maybe even talking a little bit in a meta way about themes and ideas that are coming up in the book or whatever it is you're reading um, that might relate to life. Really bringing those um, examples out uh, for, for your child is gonna be beneficial. Um, at a middle school level, we wanna actually build a little bit more of that meta awareness of language, right? So we want to play, um, uh, or we want to search for and highlight similar patterns um, in what, what the child's learning in their school day, but also in their life. Um, so thinking about how to pull themes from the subject matter again across subjects at home or in therapy sessions is really, really important. You want to expand your own language when you're talking about um, different experiences that your child may have, right? And you wanna build these um, code switching opportunities that are really explicit, right? Um, this is not only uh, practicing some mental flexibility in terms of an executive skill, but it's also um, uh, building attention, right? So you could say, how would you say that if you were talking to somebody else, right? You just made a great point. How would you say that if you're talking to your grandfather? Or how would you say that if you're talking to your teacher, right? You had a rough day today. 
and you just told me about it and that sounds like it was so frustrating um but how could we how could we go and talk about it if we needed to go talk to your teacher together something like that right recognizing that we're going to need to change our words to talk to different people that's a really important um, aspect um also promoting categorical thinking is uh, a key idea for both written language, reading and writing, and also oral language. And those things go hand in hand, right? So um, an example here is like, I put I put that experience you just described in the category of whatever it may be, um, and really trying to draw attention to the groups, uh, the meaningful groups um, that you're creating in your own mind so that your child can do that as well. Um, Another example is to say like, that was just like that other time when we did this and we went there, you know, um, they may not see some of the similarities um, in the examples that you're thinking about, but you really wanna be um, explicit about telling them. Um, also sharing insight explicitly rather than implicitly, uh, that's also gonna be quite important. So I thought this because I noticed these things or I didn't know that before, but when, uh, we went to the park and and whatever happened, um, I learned or I thought about this specific thing um, and asking for them to kind of reflect and do that back to you. Okay. Um, and then in terms of math, um, I've said this before, um, there, isn't, there isn't a whole lot of research um, looking at um, specific math interventions um, post post epilepsy surgery. Uh, but one of the things that we found is that um, we really need to advocate for allowing calculators on homework and tests uh, post epilepsy surgery for many children. It's actually not as important that they memorize those rote math facts as understand how to think in um, larger quantitative ways, right? So comparative um, comparisons, uh, between um, quantities, right? Quantitative comparisons, sorry. Um, that's gonna be an important consideration, right? And thinking about how to visualize um, the way, uh, uh, I'm losing my words. Uh, uh, so one of the things that's beneficial is being able to kind of depict what's actually happening. Um, and so having supports that you can diagram um, visual supports for math homework, um, advocating for all that is important. Um, the other thing that's quite important for math skills, uh, particularly moving into middle school and high school, is to emphasize uh, specific math vocabulary. Um, and this isn't something that necessarily is uh, usually a, an explicit um, goal in math class, but we found that the language aspect uh, that goes with talking about you know, why we do something in, in geometry or why we do something the way we do it in algebra, really um, describing that in detail um, is important for um, the student's ability to learn. And they can learn um, when that vocabulary is, is there. Okay. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, but one of the major takeaways here is to um, we really need to have students uh, reevaluated um, with full neuropsychological evaluations or full cognitive linguistic evaluations by speech pathologist. Um, so ideally, I feel, and uh, I don't know, Audrey, if you have other thoughts on this, please share, but um, repeating them at least every two to three years is often really helpful, particularly when um, we're thinking about students who've had neurosurgical intervention. Um, so. That's my presentation. Um, I welcome any questions. Um, and Dr. Christy Dulo and I will be at the conference in Boston um, this August, um, hoping to um, do some more research that involves some imaging. Um, I'm happy to talk about that if people are interested. Very cool. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. There are a number of questions, but before we launch in, I just wanted to say something to our audience. We had many, many, many questions that came in about just generally how do I get a better education for my child? So I put in the chat a number of links that um, are, we have a whole step-by-step -step process on our website about 
What is an IEP? What are the steps in the process? Amy, you alluded frequently to the importance of assessments. So none of this can be done without an assessment. If the assessment doesn't say there's a need, there's no need, according to the school. So you absolutely need to assess. You were talking about different modalities. If the child has a visual processing disorder and nobody's ever assessed that, their child's not gonna get support in that area. If they have a sensory issue and that hasn't been assessed, they're not gonna get support in that area. So, so, so important. So I will share um, some additional things as we're going through the questions here. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is I have parents that have attend either are here tonight or registered who have a one and a half year old to parents whose kids are in their twenties. For the younger kids, um, I would just say be very patient and maybe even for the older kids, my kid's 20 and he's definitely not at age level or grade level, right? Um, this can all take time. And there is some research, I don't know if you're um, familiar with this, Amy, that says that post epilepsy surgery, we're seeing improvements in cognition up to 11 years out from surgery. Um, and I think you were the one that said um, to advocate for the school team to not give up on things like reading and if they're not reading in high school yet, right? They're, they don't follow it to dip typical trajectory. So we have to really be focused on our individual kids. Is, was that you that said that? I can't remember now. I mean, I, I generally um, advocate for ongoing uh, um, therapy throughout life. Like yeah. after any sort of acquired um, um, injury or intervention or illness um, in childhood, it's always beneficial to continue trying to maximize um, the learning opportunities that are available because we know from a uh, cognitive science perspective, neuroplasticity continues to go on into really our, our, our early thirties, right? Yeah. So the idea that brain development ends, um, you know, because we've arbitrarily decided age 18 means like adulthood, um, that has nothing to do with what we know about neuroscience and neurodevelopment. Um, there are a lot of different areas, the cortex and, and what's right under it, like all the, all the brain tissue that's up there. Um, they go through different changes at different times. Um, and that's going to really affect the way a student experiences their own learning, depending on whether they're in grade school, high school, or college. Um, and the, like the general life experiences that they're having as well. Those are really, really important. It's not just about what's happening in the schools it's also what are you getting exposed to that's novel and creating interest and engagement in your in your life at large because um, your brain is going to continue developing uh well past uh mm -hmm. high school yeah all right i'm gonna kate if you're still there i'm gonna unmute you let me see i'm clicking allow to talk do you want to go ahead and ask your question hi can you hear me yes okay great um thanks so this is really helpful. Um, the, uh, I guess the question I have really is about this whole cognitive load and if that could be what um, my 17 year old might be describing as um, cognitive fatigue, um, that he um, was a previously sort of 4.0 AP student, super quick, super advanced, um, never needed to study or prepare. Um, post-surgery, um, is keeping his grades up, but it requires so much work. Um, and he's struggling with how difficult it is for him to take on new information. Um, he feels exhausted in his brain all the time. Um, we are looking that he is probably still having seizures. Um, I've been talking with Audrey quite a bit about that. We're going for a third opinion at Pittsburgh. Um, but kind of separate to even these episodes that he seems to be having multiple of a day. It's this kind of background, really 24 seven, just grinding cognitive fatigue. And does that kind of fit with this working memory cognitive load sort of concept? Or is that like something different? I think it absolutely can be in part explained by something like working memory or cognitive load. Um, one thing I usually ask uh, folks who who describe something similar is, you know, does this sense of fatigue fluctuate in any way? Um, you know, if you tend to feel it around a certain time of day, mm -hmm. usually in the later portion of the day, I usually ask, you know, what what were you doing earlier in the day? Um, sometimes I'll I'll ask 
individuals to maybe self-rate, you know, so list, list some of the things that you did today, list the subjects. If, if you're in school, you know, um, who you interacted with, um, if you had, uh, you know, if you, if you watched a particular TV program, or if you went for a walk or did any physical activity after you do these things, right. And you write them down, um, rate kind of the, the level of energy or, or um, difficulty you felt it took to do it. And I just do it like on a, on a three point scale. Was it a one, was it a two, or was it a three? Um, mm -hmm. And at sometimes we'll find that there's, there is a little bit of a pattern to the types of activities. And what you, if that's going to happen, what usually arises is that you start to see that, um, you know, just going for a walk, but in a very busy area, that's also noisy, like the mall is different than going for a walk someplace that's quiet and you know you can look off into the distance and you're not being bombarded by sounds and lights um sometimes there's a really obvious difference between the amount of of, of cognitive demand um depending on on little features like that so um you could you could explore some of that to see if there is a little bit of the cognitive load effect um that's related to kind of working memory and um input processing um, to tease that out versus something else. Um, it sounded like you might, maybe you're thinking about medications and other things like that. Um, so it could be more than one thing. Yeah. One question that came up um, both in uh, an advanced question and uh, tonight in the Q&A is basically, are there any resources that are succinctly explaining the concept of cognitive load? Because I think this is I'm pretty deep into this world and I still struggle a bit with what you're talking about. Um, educators, we, we spoke earlier about how um, you were, you were t telling me that what we really need is flexibility in the kids day and in their curriculum. And that's not really the way IEPs work. They want a very fixed program and like, this is how it's done. But is there, are there any books or resources that you can recommend that would help school teams better understand um, this issue. And if you can follow up with me later and I can share the resources with um, our families or if you have any now, but that is something that has come up and maybe we could even work together um, as an organization. We could work with your team to create sort of a cheat sheet of some resources that might be helpful for teams because that is a, a big issue that comes up. But I think what struck me tonight when we spoke earlier is the idea of that flexibility in the moment and recognizing, like you said, what happened earlier in the day, what happened the day before, and that the instruction might need to be different. Um, and, and that is very hard for teams to adapt to. But just if you have any recommendations on resources um, or examples to give to teams, school teams. Yeah, in the past, I've talked about cognitive load theory, and I think that is an, uh, an interesting resource to point teams to. I think there are ways to... Um, uh, bring the ideas of cognitive load theory, different types of cognitive load um, into the classroom setting. Uh, and I think it's actually important for teachers to have that as a reference point because it affects how they lesson plan at, or it could. Um, I know some teachers um, that do think about those concepts um, to maximize uh, how, you know, their, their classrooms at large are learning. Um, and one really important idea there is that kind of um, the relevant knowledge that people already have. Um, we wanna be building on it in the right amount, not totally introducing so many new concepts that it becomes um, unmanageable and too foreign. Um, but for, for kids post-surgery, right, that that might, that that amount of new information might need to be adjusted a little bit, right? And if teachers had a, a um, a little bit more of kind of a common dialogue around these cognitive load theory ideas. Uh, I think it might be easier to advocate um, in IEP meetings. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question about how does the cognitive overload manifest in behaviors? Um, I have some thoughts on this, but I'd love for you to answer first. So if the if the child is having, I see this all the time, the child's having behavior problems um, and the school doesn't know really how to address it because they're not looking kind of under under the surface. Um, but in terms of this cognitive load theory, would it manifest in a behavior or an um, reaction, outburst, intolerant? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You talk I think it absolutely that? can. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just like that example when, you know, I had the little revolving beach ball going, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, when we, when we hit that point where we can't take new information in, sometimes the experience of what that's like is almost like a little bit of a shutdown, right? It's like an overstimulation for some kids and that overstimulation can kind of throw, um, you know, the body into needing to react, needing to move, not being able to sit still. Um, uh, if, if that freeze feeling of just like, I, I, I can't process anymore and I just don't have any more energy or attention to give, um, does the opposite, right? It can just, it can become very, um, static, right? Like nothing's happening. We can't motivate. We can't get someone to do anything. So I think it can manifest in different ways depending on the individual. Um, but it's absolutely, um, it, it's totally expected that if we hit our cognitive load and we're at capacity, um, it's going to naturally come out in like a behavioral form. Mm -hmm. uh, just the way that behavioral manifestation shows up will, will vary. Wow. One thing that I've mentioned to this family and to other families I've worked with, especially after hemispherectomy, where there's so many impacts to different sensory systems, visual, auditory, motor, sensory, you know, uh, taste, like oral motor, everything, right? Everything's impacted. Um, if the school team doesn't really understand the full impact of all of those inputs on the child, they, they can't manage behavior because it's not really about managing behavior. It's about putting the child in an appropriate environment. And then what you're talking about is recognizing the cognitive load of the child that's appropriate for that moment, right? So it's not about like some plan that we write at the beginning of the year, but like, what does this child need today? Um, so it's it's both environment and then reacting to their immediate in the moment needs for that cognitive load, correct? Okay. I agree, yes. Um, there was a question about um, co uh, what a college age student would need. And my answer, I think we're not really talking about college. This is really focused on K to 12, but I'm happy to chat more with that family. We have a lot of resources on college. We have a transition guide, but I would, my answer was basically, what do the assessments say? Because at the end of the day, it's not, you don't get to say, this is what the child needs. You have to, you have to be doing the, um, assessments to determine what the appropriate interventions would be. Um, I suppose at college age, if you're willing to pay on your own, you could, but then that's where you run into the risk of doing like a, a brain training that isn't really going to be useful because it's like drilling on working memory that might not be effective. So I would still think working with a comprehensive team, getting that neuropsych eval and really looking at what the deficits are to find out what you need to work on, um, unless you have anything else to add on that. Uh, I guess being a speech pathologist, um, uh, who sees a lot of young adults and adult patients. Um, uh, I would, I would advocate for if, if you're not feeling like, like it's easy to, uh, get the supports you need through, um, the college environment, um, trying to find a cognitive therapist who is a speech therapist or, or a neuropsych, um, a neuropsychologist who also works with, um, other neuropsychologists that treat or or speech therapist, um, that can be beneficial. I know our job title doesn't always um, reflect all that all that we sometimes do, but um, for adults um, or college age individuals, uh, you might even be better served by a clinician who has more experience in treating, um, say, um, traumatic brain injury, um, mm -hmm. because we tend to write a lot of accommodations and recommendations for return to work and even college environment um, uh, from that angle. Um, and I think a lot of them are very similar, right? We're trying to kind of manage attention, manage that fatigue element. Um, and um, you, you know, it might be easier to find that through a health system. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think what you're saying is that working through private therapy, rather than expecting the school to know and understand what to do. And I would agree with that. My son's 20 and in college, and there's nothing really that this college can offer except for accommodations at this point, um, because there's no mandate in, in after IDEA ends, after you graduate from high school to provide anything. So in the college landscape, it's all about um, working with private therapy or privately paying um, for services, unless you're in some states that provide like regional centers and whatnot, which is pretty rare. So 
Um, okay, there's a question about reading skills. I kind of hate to go down this rabbit hole. So if you'd rather not answer this question, I will. We can move on because this session wasn't about reading, but I do think it's related. Um, so she's saying um, her eight-year-old knows all the letter sounds, but is finding it hard to tap sound and blending. It's just so hard. Um, uh, shall I follow a certain reading program like Linda Mood Bell or tell the school to introduce more intense support? He's two years out from surgery. Um, I have a thought on that, but if you want to answer first or I can answer first and you can add on, what would you like? Uh, well, I, I, one of the things that stands out was the, was the tapping component. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if, if which hand we're tapping with. I don't know if tapping is actually the skill that needs to be merged with an awareness of um, sounds and sound segmentation because of that motor component. Um, yeah. And so there could be reasons why that tapping um, performance aspect doesn't totally sync up and why it's super frustrating. Um, and it has nothing to do with um, your child's ability to kind of perceive of the differences in those sounds. It's just that the motoric piece yeah. of that task isn't totally lining up. And so it's it's creating actually cognitive load, a little bit of, of um, you know, mind body stress, right? That we just maybe don't need. That's my yeah. take. It's sort of like oral reading fluency. So if you're not all aware, oral reading fluency, if the child has a dysarthria or any sort of oral motor disability or even processing speed working memory issues, sometimes those measures of oral reading fluency just basically highlight their disability. They don't actually measure their reading because they're asking them to respond and quickly in a timed manner. And it could be the same thing. Um, I, I, my, one of my questions for this person who posted that question um, is if the child has problems with the phonological processing, have you done an auditory processing evaluation? And if so, is he working with a speech and language speech and language pathologist who's supporting central auditory processing disorder, which will occur after temporal lobectomy, um, hemispherectomy, corpus callosotomy, TPO, those any procedure that impacts the temporal lobe, in which case that you really need someone who's working in collaboration with a literacy expert. So like a, a literacy teacher in the schools is not gonna know anything about that aspect of how phonological processing is acquired when there's that kind of a deficit. So it would be really important, again, we just go back to the evaluations, um, who, who's evaluated and what do the evaluations say? Um, I actually said to, to Amy before this, we started, the number one question I always get is what intervention should I use? Should I use Linda Mood Bell? Should I do a more intensive reading intervention, which is what your question is? I can't tell you what intervention the child needs. All I can tell you is that the team has to know about every, you and the team needs to know about every single deficit the child has and be supporting it before we can even talk about methodology. So if the child's in a noisy classroom and noise is a problem, that's, a, that's the number one thing you fix. If there's visual issues, like you talked about contrast or other things that might cause visual fatigue, you have to fix that first, right? So there's so many things we have to fix before we can talk about methodology. Um, we have a number of webinars. You can go to our YouTube channel to take a look at those, to learn about those. All right, another question. Um, I was blown away by the information that cognitive effects from seizures can persist for weeks after the actual seizure. Are there specific studies that focus on this? So I have seen this in the literature as well. I don't know which specific studies, maybe Monica is gonna throw something in the chat for us because she's the one with the, the brain remembering the names of all the studies, but um, research on persistence of impact to, of seizures for weeks after seizures, which I've seen in the literature. Do you have any? I will at least, well, I don't, I don't have specific studies to, to cite. I can certainly find some, I kind of know some in my head, but I can't say them <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. now at this minute, but one, one term, one jargony kind of term that can be helpful to search for is post-ictal, mm -hmm. right? So post-ictal effects, cog post-ictal cognitive effects, um, that can be something beneficial to search for. Um, mm -hmm. you know, in a in a hospital setting, in a clinical setting, we see this all the time. Yeah. Um, but the way it shows up in schools, it, I'm I'm positive it flies under the radar. Yeah, and that's another. We do offer a free school training to our families. So those of you that are here hoping to learn more about how to better support your um, child's school experience, we can offer a free two hour training to the team, and we do talk about. Um, the impacts if the child is having ac active epilepsy about what we can expect in their performance if they had a seizure that day, right? Or multiple times that day or that month if they seize infrequently or if they had a recent hospitalization, et cetera. Um, there's another question here about um, different types of epilepsy medications. Have they been reviewed to see how they impact cognitive load based on side effects? 
Um, I do understand that epilepsy medications can impact cognition and memory, but do you have any knowledge of specific studies about medications and how they impact cognitive load or other side effects? Um, so I don't, I don't think you're going to find anything that specifically says, use, uses the term cognitive load, because I'm sort of using it in a loose interchangeable way between like working memory. Um, I think there are different ways of thinking about measuring working memory. And so there are some papers out there that certainly look at cognitive effects. Um, a lot of times it's a little easier to um, be looking at how they're talking about attention um, or maybe executive function skills. But one thing that I didn't say in the presentation is that working memory is a component that's usually seen as part of um, executive function. So it's like sort of under the umbrella of executive function. And that's one way to think about, um, you know, uh, looking for that type of information. So if you see something that's uh, if you see a paper that's talking about medication effects on the way we pay attention or medication effects on the way we use executive skills, um, you can you can bet that working memory and cognitive load are very likely implicated. And I think it's safe to kind of uh, create that that mental link. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, some of these other questions were getting a little bit general. Let me just see. Let's do one last question because we're a little bit after over time here. Um, our eight-year-old daughter who is a year out from hemispherectomy has an IEP, but since she had her testing pre-surgery and it's only every three years, the district wants to wait a whole year before doing it again. Should I push back? So I have an answer to that, but if you're welcome to go first or however you want to answer that. She had her testing pre-surgery. I, I think if there hasn't been any testing post-surgery, you should absolutely push back. 100%. Yeah. Okay. 100%. yeah. I just, this is Monica. I just squealed, but I was muted. Yeah. 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 No, if there's been a change in status. So the yeah. IDEA requires there to be assessments whenever there's been a change in the child. So I would push back to the school and just say, can you show me what research or policy you are basing this delay on? Yeah. You can't determine the child's need without current assessments. Um, Monica and I have talked about this at length in creating our IEP content, which I've shared in the chat and in the Q&A here today. Um, if uh, any craniotomy would warrant a full reevaluation, any craniotomy. So we're even a shunt placement, even, you know, as uh, my son's had three brain surgeries and the last one, it was like, you know, going away for the weekend. We were so nonchalant about it, right? It was his shunt placement. It was after the first two, you know, it seemed like not a big deal, but that's still a big deal. Anytime you're opening up the skull for any reason, um, that's warrants a full reevaluation. Um, I know you may need to run. I'm happy to answer, um, stay on and answer more questions. There's, there's three or four more questions here. Do you want to stick it out for a couple more? Or how are you feeling, Amy? I can stick it out. I was just going to mention though that, um, uh, uh, any, you mentioned craniotomy. Anytime anyone has a craniotomy, um, I usually think in my mind, clinically, we expect that it's anywhere from two to four weeks until mm -hmm. that individual child or adult um, is sort of anywhere near back to their baseline. Sometimes it happens fairly quickly and, and we're assessing and we're, we're observing. And after two weeks, somebody says, you know, I feel pretty good. We say, you look pretty good. Okay, great. You know, let's talk about returning you back to what you were doing in your day-to-day, -day, whatever that may be. Um, but sometimes it does take more like four weeks. Um, and usually that is sort of the sweet spot. So that's usually what we tell folks. If you've had a craniotomy for whether it's a minor surgery or something more substantial, like let's, let's use that four-week buffer and put that in place and, and, and reassess at that time. I'm going to put a caveat in there though, because sometimes I see families where the child had um, a neuropsych assessment via their hospital um, and they're being, or then the child just had surgery and they're saying, we don't even want to talk about a neuropsych for six to 12 months after surgery, but the kid's going back to school next month, right? Mm -hmm. The difference between a neuropsych that is to really look at what's happening um, in terms of brain function on a neuropsychological level, level and a psychoeducational evaluation that's really looking at what are the child's needs day to day in the school setting are very, very different. So they can't, and if a neuropsych eval is really needed four weeks out to really figure out what's needed for the child, 
then you should push for that because they can't develop a program for the child. Again, everything is about the assessments. It's all about what do the assessments say? So you don't want the medical basis for deferring an evaluation where the, the, the neurologist might be saying, there's still a lot of changes happening in the brain. We want to wait six months till the brain is fully healed before we do that neurocycle. Well, that's great. The child still needs a program right now because they're back at school four weeks after surgery, right? Or less. Yeah. I yeah, no, I will say that 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 is sort of um, a very general mark that I was yeah. citing, right? And so, as a clinical practitioner, I reassess people one to two weeks out, um, and then anywhere as often as we need it, depending on how much it looks like it's changing things, mm -hmm. whatever whatever yeah. aspect of cognitive function looks like it's changing. And so, certainly, if people have plans to return to work or return to school before that four week time frame, we will certainly reassess somebody and, and um, make it, you know, as full of an evaluation as is needed in order to get the accommodations or whatever um, changes to whatever IEP or um, work accommodation plan uh, is necessary. So you can find it. Um, sometimes it's just, it's hard to know which service or, um, you know, who to really ask. But I also know that there are some neuropsychologists who recognize that need as well. And will say, we can do an abbreviated evaluation. Not every neuropsychological evaluation has to be like five or six hours long with the entire battery of tests. Yeah. Um, neuropsychologists who really understand their role within a neurosurgical um, population of, of patients will say, okay, we'll do this abbreviated version. We'll screen and we'll get a broad sense of, of where functioning is at and change the time. Like that. All right, there's a few more questions, but I'm gonna ask you the one that I can't really answer and then I'm gonna let you go so you can go on with your evening. Um, but I'm happy to stay on for any families that wanna to continue to ask questions of, of me or if Monica can stay. So the question is, where does processing speed fit into the terminology of working memory and cognitive load and how are they related? So I'd love to hear your answer on this. My answer is that processing speed um, is is sometimes beneficial to look at entirely in a separate lens, right? So you can have, um, you might have limited, limited working memory capacity in, in a formal testing scenario, but have a very fast processing speed and vice versa, right? And the way that that manifests for day-to-day -day activity, learning, school activity, right, could be could be very different. Um, there could be some overlap and similarities um, with somebody else who has a very different profile of that working memory and process and speed combination. Um, but I, I, I like to look at them separately because I think that neurophysiologically, we're talking about different mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. You're welcome to stay on. I'm going to answer these last few questions for folks, or you can stay on and do that too, but I don't want to make you, I don't want to force you to stay on because I know I, I promise I'd jump, let you jump off by 510. Um, the next question is, how do you improve comprehension skills and how do you manage multiple tests in middle school? Is that something you feel you can opine on or? Is it is it auditory comprehension or reading comprehension? I'm guessing reading comprehension. Um, I can unmute that participant. Jenny, if you're still there and you want to chat, raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Um, Sandra asked about what inspired you to enter this field of study. And all I'm gonna say is Sandra, we're gonna take Amy out for drinks in Boston and we can ask her all about her inspiration, right? Or, or tea. Going to Boston, yeah. <laughs> We'd love to. All right, Jenny that. is gonna be unmuted here in just a second. Okay, go ahead. You should be able to unmute now. Jenny. Yes, it's for um reading comprehension. Ah, okay. So there was what what strategies to support reading comprehension? To improve. How can it be improved mostly? Um, yeah, so one of the one of well, I'll I'll repeat what Audrey's been saying that you need to have a full assessment of oral oral language skills and written language skills before we will know what to do. Um, but assuming that's been done, um, one other question built into that is at what at what level of um, uh, not whether, at what length, right? What length are we are we talking about? So is it sentences, multiple sentences, short paragraphs, long paragraphs? That can sometimes matter when we're thinking about this cognitive load piece too, because for a long paragraph where maybe the piece of writing is taking a long time to make the point, um, you're going to need to hold on to more pieces of information as you go through that paragraph in order to get the whole idea. So sometimes uh, reading comprehension has this 
um, cognitive load component to it. Um, and if that's the case, um, getting some uh, explicit therapy support for note-taking skills, um, using particular formats that are going to deliver the right amount of information, like in the right, right length, right size, all the features, um, so that um, your child doesn't need to hold on to so much information as they go through the reading passage. They can kind of see it stacking up and can kind of scan and, and maybe see keywords um, or key points as they go that can support reading comprehension. Um, I don't know. It, is this... Is this sounding actionable based on the context of your question? Yes. Um, mostly just like being behind grade level whenever you're um, post-surgery, um, just due to the comprehension feature of it. I mean, being read orally helps um, him, you know, versus reading it himself. But still, you know, like on different tests and stuff, they're expected to read it on their own and then answer the passage questions and it's been modified like per his IEP mm -hmm. to get you know like easier pieces done but um just you know likely you know we'd like to get him at grade level for that you know like with his peers if possible sure uh I you know it's hard because I don't know the specific details but you know sometimes it it does take a little bit of extra time, but it is possible to regain that ground, um, you know, if we're targeting the right intervention uh, and difficulty. Um, so keep at it. I don't know how long post-surgery, um, you know, it's been, but it makes sense that that he would be behind grade level if he's had surgery or multiple surgeries or any other clinical complications. That's not um, that's not abnormal. Um, and we want to try to make sure he, he's not feeling too, too much pressure, right? Because that, mm -hmm. that can make it more frustrating too. So um, the oral uh, oral reading opportunities, like read aloud to him so he can get all of that vocabulary, that is actually really, really beneficial to be getting the input of new words. Um, even if you were just working on reading those new vocabulary words that are a little bit, that are a little bit beyond the typical grade range, right? Like where are we going into a stretch zone with vocabulary, those are gonna be really good words to prioritize practicing reading um, out loud or um, doing some sort of uh, meaning-based um, homework activity. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a few more, but I'm gonna ask the last one for you um, that I can't answer, or I can, but I, I think you'll answer it better. Um, this parent says she was told that her daughter <laughs> could not have a neuropsych eval because she's non partially nonverbal. How would you respond to that? That that sounds not accurate. Um, I, uh, I don't think that should matter at all. Um, mm -hmm. Being nonverbal, there are a lot of nonverbal tests that we can kind of uh, administer in a neuropsychological kind of context or a cognitive evaluation context for the speech therapist. Um, I, I think that might just be a limitation of that individual's practice. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would pursue a different neuropsychologist or a different neuropsychological, you know, practice group. Um, that's not a very satisfying answer, but that should not, I don't, I do not believe that should be the response. That's, that's not true. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in Boston this summer and Maybe we can go on like a two hour power walk again and you can give me the work out of my life. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I didn't actually leave my email, but if anybody needs or would like to contact me, I'm throwing in the chat right now. Great. Right perfect. Wire one at mgb.org. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Take care. <clears throat> And um, anyone who's still on, if you, I'm happy to answer the last couple of questions. Um, so someone said that five years post-surgery, my seven-year-old has needs on all fronts, vision, speech, OT, fine and gross motor education. Teachers are working on phonics-based reading. We're seeing success, but I find the challenge of what to address now and what can we put on, be put on hold. So this is something we've talked a lot about in our power hours um, and that I've chatted with a lot about uh, with our families. We sort of advise to pick three things each year that you really want to work on. Like what are the key things? So it might be reading, social skills and safety one year. The next year it might be, you know, posture and mobility. 
um, vision issues and getting that auditory processing evaluation. Um, it's true we can't do it all. Not only can we not do it, but our kids get really tapped out. So um, that is something that I would recommend. Um, and if you want to join us for a power hour, we have some open forums where we discuss about these kinds of topics. Um, I, uh, and then getting a visual evaluation through the school. Um, we do have a guide on uh, vision after um, hemispherectomy, I believe is still the title of that guide, although it might be after occipital lobectomy. Um, you can find it on our website and it talks about all the different types of vision evaluations. Sometimes the school district doesn't know how to evaluate a child after epilepsy surgery and you might need to go to um, a private provider um, Monica Jones, our executive director and founder, who's on the call right now, has also done a training for um, Perkins School for the Blind that um, where practitioners can earn CEU credits to watch this. And that would teach them a lot about um, what the problems can be. And then that would be the basis for that assessment. If the school district doesn't have an evaluator, um, they still have to provide the assessment if it's needed to help provide an appropriate education for the child. So they have to evaluate in all areas of suspected disability. So if they don't have the person that can do that evaluation, it's possible that they would have to pay for it. Um, and one is done, Sandra said. Okay, so there's one person with their hand raised and this is gonna be the ultimate last question. <laughs> Let's see if I can find you. Where are you? Oh, there you are, okay. Allow to talk. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Audrey. Yeah, hi. hi. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. This is such a nice, uh, you know, informative uh, webinar. So, yeah, I am um, just, I want to continue my question. So, I I was the mom who answered, who questioned about the eight year old kid after two years of surgery. He's not, you know, he's tapping sound and all where he's, he's struggling right now for reading. Uh, and uh, you uh, uh, you answered that maybe you can get evaluation overall like uh, is there any central processing disorder all those stuff so that we can know and then address that thing so um uh, i talked to one of his provider behavioral therapist and all so they say that they do the ordinary uh, uh these kind of uh, testing when the kids are like uh, you know 10 or 12 year old, old then only they can be assessed for central processing disorder he is like eight year old he cannot be evaluated for that I, it's not like you know he won't get appropriate uh, you know answers from if, if they do it too so i was like whether i push it for that uh, yeah is has your child had a hemispherectomy or a temporal lobectomy? He has a hemispherectomy two years back. So if you look at our YouTube channel, there's several webinars on hemispherectomy that talk about how it's anatomically impossible to not have some di deficits in dichotic listening, which is a multiple sound environment like a classroom. Um, pretty high level of challenges with localization, finding out, figuring out where sound is coming from, which is an issue with safety in street crossings and navigating a playground, all of that in, in about 98% of individuals after hemispherectomy. Some children, yeah. it's harder to test them if because the tests are behavioral. So, so what you're... Um, what you're, the person you talk to might be saying is that he's not behaviorally ready to be participate in the testing, but there are screening okay. measures for children as young as age three that can indicate the presence of the disorder. Between that okay. and a literature review, it would show the team the need for a quiet setting, maybe an FM system, maybe one-on-one -on -one instruction for key learning, key academic learning in a quiet setting, those okay. sorts of so um, yes, you can push back on it. In the chat, I had initially put our IEP process, which is online. You can look at that. There's webinars on how, which assessments are needed and how to ask for them. Um, so if you get a no, you don't have to take no for an answer. You can submit the letter. We have a sample letter that's from the neurologist and the neurosurgeon describing the impacts of the surgery to the school team that you can send along with a letter requesting needed evaluations. And then it's up mm -hmm. to the schools to say that they will or won't do them, but they need to provide prior written notice. There's a long process involved in this. It's a little outside the, the bounds of this uh, webinar tonight. Okay. Uh, but absolutely, if the child needs to be assessed in an area that might be impacting his ability to learn, which it sounds like he is, um, I would I would ask, I would continue to ask for that assessment. So. Okay. So, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you and so much. Please join us for a future power hour. Um, I think I'm going to do an open forum next month. I don't have the date yet, but I'll, I'll do that okay. soon. And then you can, sure. we can spend a little bit longer um, talking about.
So thank you everyone for being here tonight. I really enjoyed chatting with you. It was so great to have Amy McGuire. She's brilliant and um, hope to see you all for our next Power Hour. Thank you.